All right, so I'm going to um, do the sixth morning now. So um, this chapter actually is quite a, a short one and it shouldn't really take me that long to get through it, hopefully, if I don't get distracted and start yakking on um, about things that interest me. Um, just want to identify a couple of noises for you. Um, I'm out in my bungalow. It's a terrifically hot summer's day today and you'll hear a fountain outside the window and my neighbours are swimming in their pool. So there's occasional screaming and splashing um, and that's all it is. The sixth morning. All right, let's start with looking at a little summary of um, what's in the chapter, sixth morning. So it picks up the narrative. Remember the last chapter started with the narrative breaking off suddenly. This one picks up five hours later. Balram says that he's been dealing with a death and then he promises to explain that death in a subsequent chapter, which he, he does go on to do. This chapter explores, it's quite a short and somewhat, I find it a little bit unfocused, but that kind of mirrors in a way what's going on with the characters. It explores the period immediately after Pinky leaves, or not immediately after, but after Pinky leaves Ashok and what you know, you know, Ashok sort of getting back on his feet after that event. And it also makes a series of references to um, Indian society and the potential for sort of a collapse in, in the social stability of the country or for revolution. And there's an interesting parallel there, I think, between Ashok and Balram and they're kind of losing their way in terms of morality and so forth with India itself and it kind of losing its way and I think Adiga's hoping that we are going to connect the two together and think that if the India continues along the path that it's on what has it got to look forward to you know is it really heading down the path of, of destruction of there being some kind of massive breakdown in in the social order whether the masses the poor masses rise up and overthrow the rich or some kind of you know moral or criminal decline. Anyway, I'll keep going with my summary because I am getting distracted already. Adiga seems to connect the idea of social collapse to the moral crisis and degeneration of Ashok with Balram following him into it. it, it that idea of Balram following Ashok is, is heavily promoted in this, this chapter as well. And Balram himself proposes that he becomes corrupt in the sense of stealing from his boss and also his sort of sexual corruption too, which comes later in, in the text, follows Ashok and that uh, he's copying his master. And that is one of the themes of the, the text, isn't it? That everybody is following the examples set by those at the top, those the ruthless, self-serving, bribe-taking, corrupt people at the top. So in this chapter, Ashok becomes interested in uh, other women after Pinky's departure. And Balram kind of follows the lead a little bit here. And at one point, they're almost described as almost merging as characters. At first, Balram thinks Ashok um, isn't the kind of guy to chase girls outside of marriage. And he reveals a lot of quite conservative values about sex and sexuality. And he looks down on, um, Bal on, on Ashok chasing women. And Ashok actually gets together with another woman in this chapter. At first, Balram thinks that she's a sex worker, but actually she turns out to be a woman called Uma, who is Ashok's former girlfriend, and it's made clear that Ashok's family has broken up their relationship in the past. In the middle of all of this, Balram meets a bookseller who he has a con oh, quite a long conversation with, which ends up with some references to this whole idea of revolution that I've said is kind of a theme in this chapter. Balram later eavesdrop as Ashok confides to Uma that he has to go and bribe another minister and that he hates doing this. And Balram then later takes Ashok to bribe the minister. And after Ashok comes out of the building, the minister's aide, who's called the fat man, comes out as well. And he takes off in the car with Balram and Ashok. Um, and Balram listens into their conversation. And he too mentions the possibility of social collapse and civil war. This guy, the, the minister's aide, the fat man, insists that Ashok goes with a Ukrainian sex worker. Ashok's quite resistant to this this process, but he eventually does so, and it, it almost seems like he's doing it because he feels he has to. Balram's horrified at Ashok's behaviour. His conservative values about sex shine through here. He sees Ashok as having been corrupted. Later, Balram drop, drops uh, Ashok home, 
and uh, but goes out again hoping to see the golden haired woman again so even though he's horrified at Ashok's behavior he himself is kind of captivated by the look of the golden haired woman the western woman he drives around the city and he then contemplates revolution as well and there's quite a uh, an interesting sort of surreal discussion there of uh, you know the possibility of revolution he says in the middle of that that he hopes that the fat man will be the first to die in the revolution he doesn't make it clear why he, he thinks he is but I, I think perhaps it's because he resents his having corrupted Ashok more than anything else and certainly there are many people in the text that have wronged Balram more than this guy um, so why the venom I think it's because he, he resents his corruption of Ashok uh, later, Balram finds a golden hair from the um, Ukrainian sex worker, which he uh, he snaffles and keeps for himself. Okay, I'm going to start reading and talking. Pardon me, Your Excellency, for the long intermission. It's now 6.20. You mean 6.20 a.m. So I've been gone five hours. Unfortunately, there was an incident that threatened to jeopardize the reputation of an outsourcing company I work with. A fairly serious incident, sir. A man has lost his life in this incident. No, don't misunderstand. I had nothing to do with his death, but I'll explain later. Now, excuse me a minute while I turn the fan on. I'm still sweating, sir. And let me sit down on the floor and watch the fan chop up the light of the chandelier. The rest of today's narrative will deal mainly with the sorrowful tale of how I was corrupted from a sweet, innocent village fool into a citified fellow full of debauchery, depravity, and wickedness. Okay, so I, I love this quote. First of all, I'm just going to skip forward here. So he's what he's just come back from, as we'll find out later on, is that one of his employees has run over somebody and he's had to go out and deal with this situation and deal with the police and he's, he's done some bribing of the police and sorting this situation out. His actions actually end up being ones that designed to, you know, save save his driver from getting in trouble, but also fairly supportive of the person who was killed. And his anger really and lie, lays with the police in that incident. And he's sort of he's come back from dealing with that. So he's probably feeling through this whole chapter you know, fairly um, negative towards the establishment in, in India because, of, you know, what he's just been. Okay, so, and he, he must also, you know, be feeling fairly corrupt and and, um, and so forth from his own actions. So, um, citified, well, somebody who's been affected by the city, often derogatory characteristic of or adjusted to an urban environment. And also we've got uh, corrupted, we've got, Debauchery. Now, debauchery is is about sex and excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures, and depravity is is, is fairly similar. Um, moral corruption, uh, a wicked or morally corrupt act, um, and it's often associated with sex as well. And he says here, all these changes happened in me because they happened first in Mr. Ashok. He returned from America, an innocent man. But life in Delhi corrupted him. And once the master of the Honda city becomes corrupted, how can the driver stay innocent? So he's following Ashok down this path. Now, I thought I knew Mr. As Ashok, sir, but that's presum presumption on the part of any servant. The moment his brother left, he changed. He began wearing a black shirt with the top button open. Now, the only reason I highlighted that was I thought if you wanted to describe Ashok, you might want to use... Um, use that kind of detail from the text to talk about the way he's kind of sexified himself up um, and he's now out on the pool. And uh, he changed his perfume as well. To the mall, sir? Yes. Which mall, sir? The one where Madam used to go. But Mr. Ashok would not take the bait. He was punching the buttons on his mobile phone and he just grunted. Sahara Mall, Balram. That's the one Madam liked going to, sir. Don't keep talking about Madam in every other sentence. I sat outside the mall and wondered what he was doing there. There was a flashing red light on the top floor and I guessed that it was a disco. Lines of young men and women were standing outside the mall, waiting to go up to that red light. I trembled with fear to see what these city girls were wearing. See, he, is, he does have this. I don't think, I think he's actually serious here, that he's, he's a bit freaked out 
by these kind of overt displays of of, um, of sexuality. Mr. Ashok didn't stay long in there, and he came out alone. I breathed out in relief. Back to Buckingham, sir. Not yet. Take me to the Sheraton Hotel. As I drove into the city, I noticed that something was different about the way Delhi looked at that night. Had I never before seen how many painted women stood at the sides of the road. Now, painted women are sex is an old, old term for sex workers. Had I never seen how many men had stopped their cars in the middle of the traffic to negotiate a price with these women. I closed my eyes. I shook my head. What's happening to you tonight? At this point, something took place that cleared my confusion, but also proved very embarrassing to me and to Mr. Ashok. I had stopped the car at a traffic signal. A girl began crossing the road in a tight T-shirt, her chest bobbing up and down like three kilograms of brinjals in a bag. Now, brinjals, in case you were wondering, are eggplant. Enough said on that one, I think. Um, I glanced at the rearview mirror and there was Mr. Ashok, his eyes also bobbing up and down. I thought, aha, caught you, you rascal. And his eyes shone, for he had seen my eyes, and he was thinking the exact same thing. Aha, caught you, you rascal. We had caught each other out. This little rectangular mirror inside the car, Mr. Jabal, has no one ever noticed how embarrassing it is. How every now and then, when master and driver find each other's eyes in the mirror, it swings open like a door into a changing room, and the two of them have suddenly caught each other naked. And I find this this really interesting because the the mirror keeps popping up. And, of course, it's a way of Bowram kind of looking into the world of the rich, but it's also a way of the rich and Bowram looking at each other and connecting with each other. And sometimes there's, you know, a, a shock to them when they, they see actually see each other um, in, uh, in a kind of an honest way like that. I was blushing mercifully, the light turned green, and I drove on. I swore not to look in the rearview mirror again that night. Now I understood why the city looked so different, why my beak was getting stiff as I was driving, and I'm sure you all remember what the beak is, because he was horny, and inside that sealed car, master and driver had somehow become one body that night. So this is what I was talking about before. Balram following, he feels he's following Ashok's, poor example into this kind of world of depravity. It was with great relief that I drove the Honda into the gate of the Moria Sheraton Hotel and brought that excruciating trip to an end. Now Delhi is full of grand hotels. In ring roads and sewage pipes you might have an edge in Beijing but in pomp and splendor where none, a second to none in Delhi. Again, that's a, a one of those comments about infrastructure. What's more useful? Ring roads that you can not be stuck in traffic jams and sewage pipes or fancy hotels. Well, India's got what looks good but doesn't have the infrastructure. We've got the Sheraton, the Imperial, the Taj Palace, the Taj Mansingh, the Oberoi, the Intercontinental and many more. Now, the five-star hotels in Bangalore I know inside out having spent thousands of rupees eating kebabs of chicken, mutton and beef in their restaurants and picking up sluts of all nationalities in their bars. See, from these days when Bowram was with Ashok in Delhi, from this comment here, we can see that he becomes, in his eyes, morally corrupted during this time and that this continues on with him uh, once he himself becomes one of the rich. But the five stars of Delhi are things of mystery to me. I've been to them all, but I've never stepped past the front door of one. We're not allowed to do that. There's usually a fat guard at the glass door up at the front, a man with a waxed moustache and a beard who wears a ridiculous red circus turban and thinks he's someone important because the American tourists want to have their photo taken with him. If he so much as sees a driver near the hotel, he'll glare, he'll shake a finger like a school teacher. That's the driver's fate. Every other servant thinks he can boss over us. There are strict rules at the five stars about where the drivers keep their cars while their masters are inside. Sometimes they put you in a parking spot downstairs, sometimes in the back, sometimes up at the front near the trees, and you sit there and wait for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, yawning and doing nothing until the guard at the door, the fellow with the turban, mumbles into a microphone saying, Driver so-and-so, you may come to the glass door with the car. 
Your master is waiting for you. The drivers were waiting near the parking lot of the hotel in their usual keychain swirling, pan chewing, gossip mongering, ammonia releasing circle, crouching and jabbering like monkeys. Now I've kept that quote because it sort of, to me, it really summed up Bowram's kind of um, view, Bowram's view of the other drivers, their, their kind of um, mindlessness of their existence. Uh, the way that they just do the same thing and that ammonia releasing remember that's that's a reference to urinating um, and the crouching and jabbering like monkeys the kind of the motif of animals comes up frequently and the idea of jabbering when you it can be uh, a word that's often used um, when people are speaking in a language that someone doesn't understand it's quite a racist way of talking about people speaking another language because it kind of conjures up that idea of it being um, incomprehensible. It doesn't mean anything, and it's it's like um, animals talking. I just thought it was a great quote to, to sum up how he sees them as people really with no future, caught in a kind of a, a rut, a spiral of, not a spiral, caught, caught in a trap, really, that will just go on forever with no way out. The driver with the diseased lips was sitting apart from them, engrossed in his magazine. The rooster coop, if you like. This is part of the rooster coop, this never-ending existence. The driver with the diseased lips was sitting apart from them, engrossed in his magazine. On this week's cover, there was a photo of a woman lying on her bed, her clothes undone. Her lover stood next to her, raising a knife over her head. Murder Weekly, rupees 450. Exclusive true story. He wanted his master's wife. Love, rape, revenge. Been thinking about what I said, Country Mouse, he asked me as he flipped through a story about getting your master something he'd like. Maybe this title is, is, is interesting too. You know, that's that Bowron thinks later in the chapter about, you know, there's this kind of almost unacknowledged interest in the woman that Bowron goes with. And also earlier that, that sort of, interest that Bowram has had in Pinky as well and it's sort of been contained in this Murder Weekly which is a way of kind of containing any of the desires that the servant classes might have had and then kind of attributing them to um, some crazy person who goes nuts, does what everybody else is kind of half dreaming of doing and then, then ends up, you know, dead or in jail or whatever. Interesting. All right, been thinking about what I said, Country Mouse, he asked me as he flipped through this a story about getting your master something he'd like, hashish or girls or golf balls, genuine golf balls from the US consulate. He's not that kind. So Balram's view of Ashok at this time is still quite high. He sees him as a good moral guy, better than the rest. The pink lips twisted into a smile. Want to know a secret? My master likes film actresses. He takes them to a hotel in Jangpura with a big glowing T sign on it and hammers them hammers them there. He named three famous Mumbai actresses his master had hammered. And yet he looks like a goody-goody. Only I know. And I tell you, all the masters are the same. One day, you'll, one day, you'll believe me. Now come, read a story with me. We read like that in total silence. After the third murder story, I went to the side to a clump of trees to, make, to take an ammonia break. He walked along with me. Our piss hit the bark of the tree just inches apart. I've got a question for you. About city girls again? No, about what happens to old drivers. Huh? I mean, what will happen to me a few years from now? Do I make enough money to buy a house and then set up a business of my own? And... I've highlighted the, the, the quote, what happens to old drivers, because, you know, they're, they, they're living in the moment, these people, hand to mouth, and there's no kind of pension structure for them or anything like that. Well, he said, a driver is good till he's 50 or 55. Then the eyes go bad and they kick you out, right? That's 30 years from now, country mouse. If you save from today, you'll make enough to buy a small home in some slum. If you've been a bit smarter and made a little extra on the side, then you'll have enough to put your son in a good school. He can learn English. He can go to university. That's the best case scenario. A house in a slum, a kid in college. Best case? All right, so I've just highlighted that. 
this is the best thing Balaam can hope for if he sticks with what he's doing at the moment. A house in a slum, and these slums are real slums. Like there's no, they're, they're, these are um, corrugated iron or hessian walls, um, no toilet, and uh, they don't, you know, they, they might own them, but it's not official. They can be cleared out of them. Um, very unsanitary. But it, I read a really good book, actually, um, which I'm just going to pull up for you to show you. So it's called um, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, Life, Death and Hope in a Mumbai Undercity. I won the Pulitzer Prize. Catherine Boo's the author. Amazing. Oh, I loved it. It was such an interesting book. There in the background you can see the kind of the slums we're talking about. And actually, just like in this, this novel, many of the you know, many of the characters in this had jobs and uh, many of them their children were going to school and they were hoping to go to university and to do something better with their lives. You go, best case, well, on the other hand, this is the worst case, you can get typhoid from bad water. The boss sacks you for no reason. You get into an accident. Plenty of worst case scenarios. I was still pissing, but he put a hand on me. There's something I've got to ask you, country mouse. Are you all right? I looked at him sideways. I'm fine. Why do you ask? So just this, just going back to this, plenty of worst case scenarios. His life is completely unstable you know he could be sacked with no notice whatsoever he could be thrown into prison uh with with um if it suits his employers he he could uh you know he could become ill like his father and and not be given any medical treatment so this this life he has is is really very precarious fine why do you ask i'm sorry to tell you this but some of the drivers are talking about it openly you sit by yourself in your master's car the whole time. You talk to yourself. Do you know what you need? A woman. Have you seen the slum behind the malls? They're not bad looking. Nice and plump. Some of us go there once a week. You can come too. Driver Balram, where are you? It was the call from the microphone at the gate of the hotel. Mr. Turban was at the microphone, speaking in the most pompous, stern voice possible. Driver Balram, report at once to the door. No delay, your master wants you. I zipped up and ran, wiping my wet fingers on the back of my trousers. Mr. Ashok was walking out of the hotel with his hands, hands around a girl when I brought the car up to the gate. She was a slant-eyed one with yellow skin, a foreigner, a Nepali, not even of his caste or background. She sniffed about the seats, the seats that I had polished and jumped on them. Mr. Ashok put his hands on the girl's bare shoulders. I took my eyes away from the mirror. I have never approved of debauchery inside cars, Mr. Jabal, but I could smell the mingling of their perfumes. I knew exactly what was going on behind me. I thought he would ask me to drive him home now, but no, the carnival of fun just went on and on. He wanted to go to PVR Sackett. Now, PVR Sackett is, is the scene of a big cinema which shows 10 or 12 films at the same time and charges over 150 rupees per film. Yes, that's right, 150 rupees. That's not all. You've also got a, you've also got plenty of places to drink beer, dance, pick up girls, that sort of thing. A small bit of America in India. Beyond the last shining shop begins the second PVR. Every big market in Delhi is two markets in one. There is always a smaller, grimier mirror image of the real market tucked somewhere in um, into a by lane. And there's just a couple of things in this quote I wanted to just pull out. One is the use of the word mirror, mirror image. And, and remember I spoke just a few moments ago about the mirror in the car where the poor and the rich, the servant and the master uh, look at each other. Um, and also that the idea of two in one, India being two countries in one. Here we've got another example of that. Now you, you get often get essay questions about India being two countries in one. Or also the way that this uh, novel uses dualisms which is you know, you know when you use two often binary um binary things and kind of use them as contrasts with each other in order to you know bring out um bring out points and so forth so this is another example of that um the india being two two countries in one this is the market for the servants this other market i crossed over to this second pvr a line of stinking restaurants, tea stalls and giant frying pans where bread was toasted in oil. The men who worked in the cinemas and who sweep them clean come here to eat. 
The beggars have their homes here. I bought a tea and a potato vada and sat under a banyan tree to eat. Brother, give me three rupees. An old woman looking lean and miserable with her hands stretched out. I'm not one of the rich, mother. Go to that side and ask them. Brother, let me eat all right. Just leave me alone. She went. A knife grinder came and set up his stall right next to my tree. Holding two knives in his hand, he sat on his machine. It was one of the foot pedalled whetstones and began pedalling. Sparks began buzzing a couple of inches away from me. Brother, do you have to do your work here? Don't you see a human being is trying to eat? He stopped pedalling, blinked, and then put the blades to the whizzing whetstone again, as if he hadn't heard a word I'd said. I threw the potato vada at his feet. How stupid can you people get? And this, I've highlighted this, because if you remember, this is what Ashok says to Balram uh, in the last chapter. And it's another example of Balram copying Ashok. Um... You know, taking on his, his way of speaking, his mannerisms and so forth. The old beggar woman crossed with me into the other PVR. She hitched up her sari, took a breath and then began her routine. Sister, just give me three rupees. I haven't eaten since morning. A giant pile of old books lay at the centre of the market, arranged in a large hollow square like the Mandela made at weddings to hold the sacred fire. A small man sat cross-legged on a stack of magazines in the centre of the square of books, like the priest in charge of this Mandela of print. The books drew me towards them like a big magnet, but as soon as he saw me, the man sitting on the magazine snapped. All the books are in English. So? Do you read English? He barked. Do you read English? I retorted. There. That did it. Until then, his tone of talking to me had been servant to servant. Now it became man to man. He stopped and looked me over from top to bottom. No, he said, breaking into a smile as if he appreciated my balls. So how do you sell the books without knowing English? I know which book is is what from the cover, he said. I know this one is Harry Potter. He showed it to me. I know this one is James Hadley Chase. He picked it up. This is Khalil Gibran. This is Adolf Hitler. Desmond Bagley. The Joy of Sex. One time the publishers changed the Hitler cover so it looked like Harry Potter and life was hell for a week after that. I just want to stand around the books. I had a book once when I was a boy. Suit yourself. Isn't that amazing? I had a book once when I was a boy. All right. The only book he's ever had was once. And he just wants to stand near the books. So I stood around that big square of books, standing around books, even books in a foreign language. You feel a kind of electricity buzzing up towards you. Your Excellency, it just happens the way you get erect around girls wearing tight jeans. Except here, what happens is that your brain starts to hum. 4,700 rupees is in that brown envelope under my bed. Odd sum of money, wasn't it? There was a mystery to be solved here. Let's see. Maybe she started off giving me 5,000 and then being cheap, like all rich people are. Remember how the mongoose made me get down on my knees for that one rupee coin deducted 300. That's not how the rich think you moron. Haven't you learned yet? She must have taken out 10,000 at first, then cut it in half and kept half for herself, then taken out another 100 rupees, another 100 and another 100. That's how cheap they are. So that means they really owe you 10,000. But if she thought she owed you 10,000, then what she truly owed you was what? 10 times more? No, 100 times more. The small man putting down the newspaper he was reading turned to me from inside his mandala of books. What did you say, he shouted? Nothing. He shouted again. Hey, what do you do? I grabbed an imaginary wheel and turned it 180 degrees. Ah, I should have known. Drivers are smart men. They hear a lot of interesting things, right? Other drivers might. I go deaf inside the car. Sure, sure. Tell me, you must know English. Some of what they talk must stick to you. I told you I don't listen. How can it stick? What does this word in the newspaper mean? Privacy. I told him and he smiled gratefully. We had just started the English alphabet when I got taken out of school by my family. So he was another of the half-baked, my cast. Now remember that word privacy, that one there. That was one of the words that um, the mongoose used when he was talking about Balram, when he thought Balram couldn't understand him and, uh, you know, talking about Balram and and his, you know, poor people and how they didn't have any privacy and they didn't care to them. 
Uh, it, it didn't matter to them. Hey, I shouted, want to read some of this? He held up a magazine with an American woman on the cover, the kind that rich boys like to buy. It's good stuff. I flicked through the magazine. It was right. He was right. It was good stuff. How much does this magazine sell for? 60 rupees. Would you believe that? 60 rupees for a used magazine. And there's a fellow in Khan Market who sells magazines from England that cost 508 rupees each. Would you believe that? I raised my head to the sky and whistled. Amazing how much money they had, I said aloud, as yet as if talking to myself. And yet they treat us like animals. Wow. It's amazing how much money they have, and yet they treat us like animals. Quite a revelation there. It was as if I had said something to disturb him because he lowered and raised his paper a couple of times. Then he came to the very edge of the mandala and partially hiding his face with the paper, he whispered something. All right, this is he's whispering. This is not something you say openly. I cupped a hand around my ear. Say that again. He looked around and said a bit louder this time. It won't last forever, though, the current situation. Why not? I moved towards the Mandela. Have you heard about the Naxals? He whispered over the books. They've got guns. They've got a whole army. They're getting stronger by the day. Really? Just read the papers. The Chinese want a civil war in India, see? Chinese bombs are coming to Burma and into Bangladesh and then into Calcutta. They go down south into Andhra Pradesh and up into the darkness. When the time is right, all of India will... He opened his palms. I think he means. We talk like this for a while, but then our friendship ended, as all servant friendships must, with our masters bellowing for us. A gang of rich kids wanted to be shown a smutty American magazine. Mr. Ashok came walking out of a bar, staggering, stinking of liquor. The Nepali girl was with him. So the, what, what he means by our masters called us was his masters are the rich kids who want to buy his, his, um, his books. So um, I think this discussion is very interesting. Bowram says that what sparks this is Bowram saying to this guy something which is quite radical, that the rich have so much money but they treat their servants like animals. Um, so there's a lack of, there's no gratitude there and not an acceptance of the situation. Having been given this little bit of encouragement, the man confides something in him which is quite radical, you know, this, this idea that the Naxals, remember we talked about them, they were that sort of paramilitary rebellious group of guerrillas that were hiding in the countryside and they go around targeting the landlords and so forth, that they are building their power and that India could actually end up in a civil war because of this situation. On the way back, the two of them were talking at the top of their voices and then petting and kissing began. My God, and he a man who was still lawfully married to another woman. I was so furious that I drove right through four red lights and even smashed into an ox cart and almost smashed into an ox cart that was going down the road with a load of kerosene cans, but they never noticed. Good night, Bowram, Mr. Ashok shouted as he got out hand in hand with her. Good night, Bowram, she shouted. They ran into the apartment and took turns jabbing the call button for the lift. When I got to my room, I searched under the bed. It was still there, the Maharaja tunic he had given me, the turban and the dark glasses too. I drove the car out of the apartment block, dressed like a Maharaja with the dark glasses on. No idea where I was going, I just drove around the malls. Each time I saw a pretty girl, I hooted the horn at her and her friends. I played his music. I ran his aircon at full blast. I drove back to the building, took the car down into the garage, folded the dark glasses into my pocket and took off the tunic. I spat over the seats of the Honda City and wiped them clean. So this copying of Ashok and this rule breaking here is sort of it's that kind of escalating behaviour. It's exactly what the mongoose was worried he would do. The next morning, he didn't come down or call me up to his room. I took the lift and stood near the door. I was feeling guilty about what I had done the previous night. I wondered if I should make a full confession. I reached for the bell a few times and then sighed and gave up. After a while, there were soft noises from inside. I put my ear to the wood and listened. But I have changed. Don't keep apologising. I had more fun last evening than in four years of marriage. When you left for New York... 
I thought I'd never see you again, and now I have. That's the main thing for me. I turned away from the door and slapped my forehead. My guilt was growing by the minute. She was his old lover, you fool, not some pickup. Of course, he would never go for a slut. I had always known that he was a good man, a cut above me. So this is all revealing of how Balaam sees Ashok as, as being, you know, a good guy. I pinched my left palm as punishment and put my ear to the door again. The phone began to ring from inside, silence for a while, and then he said, that's puddles and that's cuddles. You remember them, don't you? They always bark for me. Here, take the phone, listen. Bad news? Her voice, after a few minutes. You look upset. I have to go and see a cabinet minister. I hate doing that. This They're all so slimy. The business I'm in, it's a bad one. I wish I were doing something else, something clean, like outsourcing. Every day I wish it. Interestingly, Balram later on, when he becomes a, a, uh, a rich person, that's what he does. He does outsourcing. Um, but this is, I've, I've collected these quotes because this is, this is Balram's attitude to what he's been asked to do by his family. It's slimy. It's a bad business. It's dirty. And he doesn't like it. He knows it's wrong. Why don't you do something else then? It was the same when they told you not to marry me. You couldn't say that no then either. It's not that simple, Uma. They're my father and brother. I wonder if you have changed, Ashok. The first call from darn bad and you're, oh, you're back to your old self. Look, let's not fight again. I'll send you back in the car now. Oh, no, I'm not going back with your driver. I know his kind, the village kind. They think that any unmarried woman they see is a whore. And he probably thinks I'm a Nepali because of my eyes. You know what that means for him. I'll go back on my own. This fellow's all right. He's part of the family. You shouldn't be so trusting, Ashok. Now, I've just collected these, these quotes um, as evidence for Ashok still being the lamb to the slaughter. He trusts Ashok. Um, and uh, Uma knows he shouldn't. Delhi drivers are all rotten. They sell drugs and prostitutes and God knows what else. Not this one. He's stupid as hell, but he's honest. He'll drive you back. Now, Ashok has no idea who Balram is because he's certainly not stupid and he's not honest either. No, Ashok, I'll get a taxi. I'll call you in the evening. I realised that she was edging towards the door and I turned and tiptoed away. There was no word from him until evening and then he came down for the car. He made me go from one bank to another bank. Sitting in the driver's seat, I watched through the corner of my eye. He was collecting money from the automatic cash machines. Four different ones. Then he said, Valram, go to the city. You know the big house that's on the Ash Ash Ashoka Road where we went to with Mukesh, sir, once? Yes, sir, I remember. They've got two big Alsatian guard dogs, sir. Exactly. Your memory's good, Valram. I saw in the spy mirror that Mr. Ashok was pressing the buttons on his mobile phone as I drove, probably telling the minister's servant that he was coming with the cash. So now I understood at last what work my master was doing as I drove him through Delhi. I'll be back in 20 minutes, Balan, Mr. Ashok said. When we got to the minister's bungalow, he stepped out with the red bag and slammed the door. A security guard with a rifle sat in a metal booth over the red wall of the minister's house, watching me carefully. The two Alsatian dogs roaming the compound barked now and then. It was the hour of sunset. The birds of the city began to make a row as they flew home. Now Delhi, Mr Premier, is a big city, but there are wild places in it. Big parks, protected forests, stretches of wasteland, and things can suddenly come out of these wild places. As I was watching the red wall of the minister's house, a peacock flew up over the guard's booth and perched there. For an instant, its deep blue neck and its long tail turned golden in the setting sunlight. Then it va vanished. In a little while, it was night. The dogs began barking. The gate opened. Mr. Ashok came out of the minister's house with a fat man, the same man who had come out that day from the president's house. I guessed that he was the minister's assistant. They stopped in front of the car and talked. The fat man shook hands with Mr. Ashok, who was clearly eager to leave him. But, ah, it isn't so easy to let go of a politician or even a politician's sidekick. I got out of the car, pretending to check the tyres, and moved into eavesdropping distance. 
Don't worry, Ashok. I'll make sure the minister gives your father a call tomorrow. Thank you. My family appreciates your help. What are you doing after this? Nothing. Just going home to Garagayon. A young man like you going home this early? Let's have some fun. Don't you have work on the elections? The election's all wrapped up. It's a landslide. The minister said so this morning. Elections, my friend, can be managed in India. It's not like America. And I've just collected that as a good quote on the corruption of the Indian political system. Brushing aside Mr. Ashok's protest, the fat man forced his way into the car. We had just started down the road when he said, Ashok, let me have a whiskey. Here in the car, I don't have any. The fat man seemed astonished. Everyone has whiskey in their car in Delhi. Ashok, didn't you know this? He told me to go back to the minister's bungalow. He went inside and came back with a pair of glasses and a bottle. He slammed the door and breathed out and said, now this car, now this car is fully equipped. Mr. Ashok took the bottle and got ready to pour the fat man a glass when he smacked his lips in annoyance. Not you, you fool, the driver. He is the one who pours the drinks. I turned around at once and turned myself into a barman. This driver is very, very talented, the fat man said. Sometimes they make a mess of pouring a drink. You'd never guess that his cast was a teetotal one, would you? I tightened the cap on the bottle and left it next to the gearbox. I heard the clinking of glasses behind me and the two voices saying, Cheers! Let's go, the minister's sidekick said. Let's go to the Sheraton, driver. There's a good restaurant down in the basement there, Ashok. Quiet place. We'll have some fun there. I turned the ignition key and took the dark egg of the Honda City down the streets of New Delhi. A man's car is a man's palace. I can't believe you've never done this. Well, you'd never try it in America, would you? That's the whole advantage of being in Delhi, dear boy. The fat man slapped Mr. Ashok's thigh. He sipped and said, What's your situation, Ashok? Coal trading these days. People think it's only technology that's booming, but coal, the media pays no attention to coal, does it? The Chinese are consuming coal like crazy, and the price is going up everywhere. Millionaires are being made left, right and centre. Sure, sure, the fat man said. The China effect. He sniffed his glass. But that's not what we in Delhi mean when we say situation, dear boy. The minister's sidekick smiled. Basically, what I'm asking is, who services you down there? He pointed at a part of Mr. Ashok's body that he had no business pointing at. I'm separated, going through a divorce. I'm sorry to hear that, the fat man said. Marriage is a good institution. Everything's coming apart in this country. Families marriages, everything. And I'm just going to keep this too. Everything's coming apart in this country. I think that to an extent, that's that's what's being said is that, you know, the, the country is actually not working well. Um, and part of it is that sort of tearing up of, of families where, you know, they can't make ends meet and live together and so forth. He sipped some whiskey and said, tell me, Ashok, do you think there will ever be a civil war in this country? So another reference to this idea of, of um, upheaval. Why do you say that? Four days ago, I was in a court in Ghaziabad. The judge gave an order the lawyers didn't like, and they simply refused to accept his order. They went mad. They dragged the judge down and beat him in his own court. The matter was not reported in the press but I saw it with my own eyes. If people start beating the judges in their own courtrooms, then what is the future for our country? So I'm just going to keep that. Now that's that breakdown of law and order. You know, what's the future of a country where you know a judge can't hand down a decision without being attacked? Something icy cold touched my neck. The fat man was rubbing me with his glass. Another drink driver. Yes, sir. Have you ever tried this trick, Your Excellency? A man steering the car with one hand and picking up a whiskey bottle with the other hand, hauling it over his shoulder and pouring it into a glass, even as the car is moving, without spilling a drop. These skills required of an Indian driver. Not only does he have to have perfect reflexes, night vision and infinite patience, he also has to be the consummate barman. Would you like some more, sir? I glanced at the minister's sidekick at the fat, corrupt folds of flesh under his chin, then glanced at the road to make sure I wasn't driving into anything. Pour one for your master now. 
No, I don't drink much, really. I'm fine. Don't be silly, Ashok. I insist. Fellow, pour one for your master. So I had to turn and do the amazing one hand on the wheel, one hand with the whiskey bottle trick all over again. The fat man went quiet after the second drink. He wiped his lips. When you're in America, you must have had a lot of women. I mean, the local women. No. No? What does that mean? I was faithful to Pinky, my wife, the whole time. My, you were faithful. What an idea. Faithfully married. No wonder it ended in divorce. Have you never had a white woman? I told you. God, why is it always the wrong kind of Indian who goes abroad? Listen, do you want one now, a European girl? Now? Now, he said. A female from Russia. She looks just like that American actress. He mentioned her name. You want to do it? A whore? The fat man smiled. A friend. A magical friend. Want to do it? No, thanks. I'm seeing someone. I just met someone. I knew along... The fat man took out his mobile phone and punched some numbers. The light of the phone made a blue halo on his face. She's there right now. Let's go see her. She's a stunner, I tell you, just like that American actress. Do you have 30,000 on you? No, listen, I'm seeing someone. I'm not... No problem, I'll pay now. You can pay later. Just put it into the next envelope you give the minister. He put his hand on Mr. Ashok's hand and winked, then leaned over and gave instructions to me. I looked at Mr. Ashok in the rearview mirror as hard as I could. A whore? That's for people like me, sir. Are you sure you want this? So this is Bower, I'm thinking, don't, don't fall to this depth, Mr. Ashok. I admire you. Don't, don't do it. I wish I could have told him this openly, but who was I, just the driver? I took orders from the fat man. Mr. Ashok said nothing, just sat there sucking his whiskey like a boy with a soda. Maybe he thought it was a joke, or maybe he was too frightened of the fat man to say no. But I will defend his honour to my deathbed. They corrupted him. So just a quote there about uh, how highly Balram thinks of Ashok and how much slack he's prepared to cut for him. The fat man made me drive to a place in Greater Kailash, another housing colony where people of quality live in Delhi. Touching my neck with his icy glass when I had to make a turn, he guided me to the place. It was as large as a small palace with big white columns of marble up the front. From the amount of garbage thrown outside the walls of the house, you knew that rich people lived here. And I just I just like that quote, so I kept it. Because in that novel I was telling you about the um, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, um, that that was actually what a lot of the people did for money was collect collect rubbish and they got, it, got um, prices, small amounts of money for collecting pieces of plastic and paper and so forth. The fat man held open the car door as he spoke into a phone. Five minutes later he slammed the door shut. I began sneezing. A weird perfume had filled the back of the car. Stop that sneezing and drive us towards Jangpura, son. Sorry, sir. The fat man smiled. He turned to the girl who had got into the car and said, Speak to my friend Ashok in Hindi, please. I looked into the rearview mirror and caught my first glimpse of this girl. It's true, she did look like an actress I had seen somewhere or other. The name of the actress, though, I didn't know. It's only when I came to Bangalore and mastered the use of the internet in just two quick sessions, mind you, that I found her photo and name on Google. Kim Bassinger. That was the name the fat man had mentioned. I'm just going to find you a photo of Kim Bassinger. Yeah, Kim, Kim Bassinger is 64 years old now, but she was, you know, very famous um, in the, I suppose, the 1980s, actually, and when she was younger, obviously, she had blonde hair, very... Very beautiful. She still does all right for someone in their 60s. That was the name the fat man had mentioned. And it was true. The girl who got in with the fat man did look exactly like Kim Bassinger. She was tall and beautiful. But the most remarkable thing about her was her hair, golden and glossy, just like in the shampoo advertisements. How are you, Ashok? She said in perfect Hindi. She put her hand out and took Mr. Ashok's hand. The minister's assistant chuckled. There. India has progressed, hasn't it? She's speaking in Hindi. He slapped her on the thigh. Your Hindi has improved, dear. Mr. Ashok leaned back to speak to the fat man over her shoulder. Is she Russian? Ask her. Don't ask me, Ashok. Don't be shy. She's a friend. Ukrainian, she said in her accented Hindi. 
I'm a Ukrainian student in India. I thought I would have to remember this place, Ukraine, and one day I would have to go there. So Balram's a bit taken with the look of this girl. Ashok, the fat man said, go on, touch her hair, it's real. Don't be scared, she's a friend. He chuckled. So he didn't hurt, did it, Ashok? Say something in Hindi to Mr. Ashok, dear. He's still frightened of you. You're a handsome man, she said. Don't be frightened of me. Driver, the fat man leaned forward and touched me with his cold glass again. Are we near Jangpura? Yes, sir. When you go down to the Masjid Road, you'll see a hotel with a big neon T sign on it. Take us there. I got them there in ten minutes. You couldn't miss the hotel. The big T sign on it glowed like a lantern in the dark. Taking the gold-haired woman with him, the fat man went up to the hotel reception where the manager greeted him warmly. Mr. Ashok walked behind them and kept looking from side to side like a guilty little boy about to do something very bad. Half an hour passed. I was outside, my hands on the wheel the whole time. I punched the little ogre. I began to gnaw at the wheel. I kept hoping he'd come running out, arms flailing and screaming, Balram, I was on the verge of making a mistake. Save me, let's drive away at once. An hour later, Mr. Ashok came out of the hotel, alone and looking ill. The meeting's over, Balram, he said, letting his head fall back on the seat. Let's go home. I didn't start the car for a second. I kept my finger on the ignition key. Balram, let's go home, I said. Yes, sir. When we got back to Garagayon, he staggered out towards the lift. I did not leave the car. I let five minutes pass and then drove back to Jangpura, straight to the hotel with the tea on it. I parked in a corner and watched the door of the hotel. I wanted her to come out. A rickshaw puller drove up next to me, a small, unshaven, stick-thin man who looked dead tired as he wiped his face and legs clean with a rag and went to sleep on the ground. On the seat of his rickshaw was a white advert- advertising sticker. Is excess weight a problem for you? Called Jimmy Singh at Metro Gym. And I think that, gee, that contrast, that two Indias there where you've got the the stick-thin man, which is like Balram's father, who's like almost like Balram's shadow, who Balram's... Remember the, what happens to old drivers? Um, you know, Balram's future is his father. And, and here we have that duality again of the stick, stick-thin stick um, Indian driver next to the sign for the rich who have a weight problem. You know, yeah, pretty nice writing, Mr. Aravinda Diga. The mascot of the gym, an American with enormous white muscles, smiled at me from above the slogan. The rickshaw puller's snoring filled the air. Someone in the hotel must have seen me. After a while, the door opened. A policeman came out, peered at me, and then began walking down the steps. I turned the key. I took the car back to Garagayon. Now I've driven around Bangalore at night too, but I never get the feeling here that I did in Delhi. The feeling that if something is burning inside me as I drive, the city will know about it. She will burn with the same thing. So the city is burning with whatever it's inside Balram. My head was bitter that night. The city knew this, and under the dim orange glow cast, dim orange glow cast everywhere by the weak street lamp, she was bitter. bitter. So the city's bitter. Balram's bitter. Speak to me of civil war, I told Delhi. I will, she said. So he's, he's, it's almost like he's asking the city, you know, could, could there be a rebellion against this current craziness? I will, she said. An overturned flower urn on a traffic island in the middle of the road. Next to it, three men sit with open mouths. An older man with a beard and white turban is talking to them with a finger appraised. Cars drive by him with their dazzling headlights and the noise drowns out his words. He looks like a prophet in the middle of the city, unnoticed except by his three apostles. They will become his three generals. That overturned flower urn is a symbol of some kind. So this guy, this is Balram, he's imagining, he's listening to a man talking to other men and he looks like a prophet. So a prophet is somebody who, you know, gets other people, a person regarded as an inspired teacher, Um, but he's, he's... unnoticed by people so it's going under the under the radar we've got people talking to other people so these apostles are like followers um so these are jesus had apostles 
Um, so apostles can be the followers of a prophet. So, but what is this man talking to these guys about? Is it about civil war or rebellion? They will become his three generals. So these guys then are going to go off and get their own followers. Speak to me of blood on the streets, I told Delhi. The idea of blood on the streets, this phrase is one that's often associated with you know with civil war and rebellions there there'll be blood on the streets many people will be fighting to the death i will she said i saw other men discussing and talking and reading in the night alone or in clusters around street lamps by the dim lights of delhi i saw hundreds that night under trees shrines intersections on benches squinting at newspapers holy books journals communist party pamphlets what were they reading about? What were they talking about? But what else of the end of the world? So he's thinking, are all of these people thinking of ways that they can smash up this system and change things? And if there's blood on the streets, I asked the city, do you promise that he'll be the first to go? That man with the fat folds around his neck? A beggar sitting by the side of the road, a nearly naked man coated with grime and with wild, unkempt hair in long coils like snakes, looked into my eyes. Promise. So this this idea is, is of the beggars, of the poor, nearly naked, the, those who have nothing. Uh, when they rebel, they're going to get these rich, fat people. And he says, promise. So this is not really happening. This is all Baum's imagination. Um, but what, what I love about this is, is I get these boring essays about Bar Barham's a bad man because he committed a murder to get some money. Actually, he's, what he's got to say is a lot more complex than, than that. Um, it, you know, he's talking about a country and, you know, the lack of possibility and hope within it and the desperate measures that he's taken as an individual, but also ones that he thinks there's potential there for, for millions of people if they band together to take, you know, quite radical measures um, to, you know, rid themselves of, you know, of the, um, the vast inequality of that country. Coloured pieces of glass have been embedded into the boundary wall of Buckingham Towers B block to keep robbers out. See up here, I'm just going to highlight Communist Party pamphlets. All right, or holy books. So that doesn't just mean they're going to, this could be communist revolution. Maybe they'll be... Uh, you know, some some kind of you know extreme religious rebellion or something like that. He doesn't. You don't know. But blood on the streets, upheaval. Um, back to the Buckingham Towers, number B. When headlights hit them, the shards glow, and the walls turn to a technicolour glass spined monster. The gatekeeper stared at me as I drove in. I saw rupee notes shining in his eyes. What he means by this is that. The gatekeeper is noticing Baron bringing the car in on his own. This is the second time he has seen me going out and returning on my own. So his Baron knows that this guy is going to blackmail him and threaten to tell his master that he's been taking the car out. In the car park, I got out of the driver's seat and carefully closed the door. I opened the passenger's door and went inside and passed my hand along the leather. I passed my hands from one side of the leather seats to the other three times and then I found what I was looking for. I held it up to the light, a strand of the golden hair. I've got it on my desk to this day. Okay. So um, a funny little chapter, that one, but I think it's interesting uh, in that it brings in that element of um, the sort of the way that the society is not serving the poor. Could this spill over into a rebellion? Um, the way that the, the, the sort of the... Um, the, the the collapse of morals amongst the rich spill down to the lower classes um, and can kind of lead to this sort of um, society, you know, sort of uh, falling apart, I suppose. A um, bit of an unfocused chapter, but we've finished it, thankfully, and hopefully I'll be able to eventually get the next one up. Thanks for listening.